It's time for Thriller Thursdays here on the Mutual Audio Network, if you dare. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. Chapter 29 We were in the back room of the Rex by 9.15 the next morning, having spent the most of the night driving from nowhere in particular to nowhere else. I hoped this worked. I could use some sleep. Trixie's bit about the three letters had been convincing. Convincing enough that we decided we should actually do something more or less exactly like that. If Bratzi was conning us, if this was a setup, at least we could hope that he'd lose Rossetti's shirt for him in the process. And afterwards, one may presume his own head. So we wrote out letters full of details, the whole mess, and sealed them up with instructions regarding the aftermath of our grisly demise. It isn't easy to think about who you send something like that to, but we did it. About 11.30, we had finally posted them from the lobby of the Metrolite Hotel, throwing in some of the better prints from the Jimmy Lish collection for good measure. It was all pretty neat and tidy, except for the grisly demise part, which I was still keen to avoid. Malik's coffee house was mostly retail, but he still opened up at 8 in the morning, and I was back on a nice even keel by the time we made our way into the back room of the Rex Hotel, which was more of a saloon with some rooms to flop located above. The back room was regularly used as a meeting place by less than legitimate businessmen, and the staff had long ago learned to pay no attention to whoever went in or who came out. Past the heavy wooden doors were three steps down, each one about six feet wide, as if to accommodate the crowds that had used this room when it had been a speakeasy. The rest of the room may once have been mostly dance floor, and you could tell where the bar had been from the marks along the wall where it had been removed maybe a decade ago. But now the room was dominated by a conference table, about twelve feet long, with one end pointing towards the stairs. Trixie and I removed all but two seats, one at each end, and I stood on the chair opposite the entrance and twisted out the light bulb above that end of the table. Then I sat down. Trixie took up her position behind the door, and we waited. She was nervous. She'd be damned before she'd show it, but she was nervous. I'd have bet real money that she'd never done anything like this before, but she kept her cool and played her part. She just had less to say than usual, which wasn't a bad thing either. Some people get chatty when they're nervous and can't wait quietly under any circumstances. I've always found the opposite to be the better approach myself, and since she didn't seem to mind, we waited in silence. The door didn't open until ten past, and those last ten minutes were the worst. We were down to our final trick here, and if we got trumped, it was the end of everything. I tried not to think about that by thinking about breakfast instead, which I had not actually had yet and would probably not want afterward. At last, the heavy doors opened and a man the size of a mountain walked in. His eyes were expressionless as he took in the scene. This one had to be Rossetti's. In his day, this is what you wanted in a bodyguard. Didn't matter that he was slow and probably thick as a plank. He was the biggest man Rossetti could find, and that meant his boss was important. He stood at the bottom of the steps like a stone colossus and stared at me as I sat in semi-shadows. From behind him, I heard the click of expensive shoes on the tiled steps. Rossetti was entering slowly, as if the meeting meant nothing to him. He was so deliberately aloof he hardly even looked at the table and didn't seem to register that I was alone. A third shape came in, carefully closing the doors behind him and locking them from the inside quietly. No reason for him to do that unless he was Bratzi's man. Rossetti looked up and saw what I sincerely hoped was my shadowy form. He snorted in disgust. Going for the dramatic effect, Chick? he asked. It was a good thing he wasn't really meeting Chick Mason today. Mason was known to have a pretty bad temper and probably wouldn't have appreciated the contempt. Of course, I'm not entirely sure how much worse things could have gotten for Rossetti today, but I felt sure that Mason would have found a way. I said nothing. The man at the door slipped in behind his giant companion, who did not react or move until he suddenly gasped. He twitched one arm three times, as though reaching for an itch in his sleep as his eyes rolled back into his head. He fell forward onto his face like a bag of sand, and I knew that he was dead. Sorry, Sal, Bratzi's men said quietly, a knife in his hand. Rossetti stared, his face a mask of wonder. Where do you want it? I asked from where I sat, the room obliging me with an echo like thunder rolling in over the mountains. The man with the knife shrugged. Make it convincing, he said. I got a reputation to keep. Joey, Rossetti said, his voice an angry wheeze. What the hell is this? Sorry, Al, Joey said. Just business. Joey, I said. Take off your hat. What? Joey asked. Sure thing. He was confused, but he obliged, removing his grey fedora just before the sap in Trixie's hand came down hard on the back of his head. He went limp and fell. 
poor guy. I'd feel that for weeks. I know I always did, back in the day when I was earning the name Blackjack by taking a sap from every punk in town. Yes, I asked. He'll live, Trixie spat. She was pretty tough, and even Rosetti bought it. But I could tell she couldn't look the old man in the eye. What the hell is this, Mason? Rosetti asked, furious. You ready for a war? Doesn't matter if he's ready or not, I said. There's a war coming. My guess is he takes it all, though. Your boys are soft. You're not Mason, Rosetti said. No, I said, I'm not. Well, he fumed. Big Al was not used to someone else controlling the tempo of the conversation. I'm Jack Justice, I said. Who? Rosetti asked. That's cute, I said. I like that. But you're not the soldier that you were 15 years ago, Rosetti. You don't put out enough death marks these days that you don't know who every one of them is. All right, wise guy, Rosetti said. You're that dumb private dick that got in the middle of my business. He looked at Trixie. And this must be Dixon. What, are you two working a sister act these days? Trixie said nothing, but she did meet his gaze and held it hard. All right. Rosetti stepped into the room like he was going to have a seat at the table. You wanted a meeting and you got it. That's not why I'm here, I said, standing. Don't be stupid, Rosetti said with contempt. You killed four people, I said, stepping away from the chair and into the light. I killed a lot more than that, he said. Not lately, I said. And no one you loved like Janet Timms. Janet, he almost whispered. You knew Janet? I shook my head. I only saw her once. She belonged to me. Rosetti said, as if it were a simple, incontestable fact. From the time she was sixteen, she was mine. I gave her everything. It took a hell of a nerve for her to betray me. Maybe she wanted her life back, I said. Maybe she felt it was worth more than what you'd paid for it. And maybe in the end she was just another parasite, Rosetti said. Another greedy, grasping whore. You know how many people have their hands out to me every single day? Why should I take that from a used-up mall like Janet? She knew what the long branch meant to me. So you killed her, I said. Yes, he said. There were millions of dollars at stake. Don't tell me you haven't done it for a hell of a lot less. I had nothing to say to that, so I didn't. That's it? Rosetti asked. Is that the end of your righteousness? She was beautiful and she broke my heart and I killed her? So what? And who else are we supposed to cry over? That piece of trash, Jimmy Lish? What about Anne Mayfield? Trixie asked quietly. She never did a thing to you, and you never even met her. You framed her and strung her up like a dog. Rosetti nodded. That felt like a mistake, he admitted, as though the words absolved him of any blame. We thought Mayfield could still be saved. But she had him in a panic, and she wouldn't lay off. Even when my boys tried to put the scare in her, she just wouldn't let it go. She was wronged, and she was going to tell the world. We couldn't have that. Just business, Trixie said. Just business, he agreed. But Mayfield never would settle down. He kept right on making stupid mistakes. Like he did when he involved you, he said, looking back to me. That was stupid. When he discovered the photos at Janet's, he should have come right to me. Maybe he didn't trust me. Didn't know for sure that I wasn't behind it all. He'd never have said so, of course. But he was a weak man. Never built for crime, not even a soft one. Does what you did to Riverton feel like a soft crime, I asked. Rosetti snorted. Riverton? Are we down to that? Don't you know what they say? The expressway is bringing a new age of prosperity, and it's going to run right into the heart of Riverton. Don't talk politics, I said. It's beneath you. Rossetti laughed. You're right, Justice. The truth is I don't know what the expressway will do, and I don't care. I just know that from the time I saw the plans for this, I knew this was the way. Put the money I had worked for all my life and my father before me into buildings— Sell them to the government at a profit that would more than cover the tax, and presto, the Rosettis are legit. No more intrigue, no more meetings in the back room at the Rex, and just business can finally mean exactly that. I worked for this longer than you could know, Justice, and nothing was going to queer this deal for me. Nothing, I said, but here we are. Rosetti shrugged. You made your point, he said. You want the mark taken off you? It's gone. Trixie looked at me. I didn't take my eyes off Rossetti. Somehow, I'm not sure I can believe you, Al, I said dryly. I mean it, Rossetti said. You're smart enough, you're tough enough, I could use you. Both of you. You see, I can't trust any of my old crowd, he indicated his fallen bodyguards. This time next month, Al Rossetti is totally legit and you can get in on the ground floor. Trixie, I asked. I knew what the answer was, but it seemed like the time to ask anyway. 
We should go, she said, breaking away from the spot by the stairs she had held down all this time, making for the door that led to the back hall. If she didn't want to watch, it was okay. I raised the pistol in my hand. It was a thirty-eight, unfamiliar, but reliable. It would get the job done. My guts were churning. They always did. It didn't matter how many times you'd been here. It didn't matter if it was them or you. It didn't matter how good at it you were. I wondered if Big Al Rossetti knew what I was feeling. Wait, Rossetti ordered. Don't be stupid. We can make a deal. A man like that kills lots of people, but he never pulls the trigger himself. He wouldn't have understood. Sorry, Al. Just business. I lied. And we already made a deal with the new management. So, do you like comedy? If you do, then Friday Follies might be just the feed for you. From the Mutual Audio Network, every Friday we bring you a selection of hilarious audio drama. And you can find it wherever you find your podcasts. Just search for Friday Follies, or you could subscribe to the main Mutual Audio Network feed. It's up to you. Find us there. The Mutual Audio Network. Listening and imagining together.